Don't move. Good shot, Avon. I was aiming for his head. I thought it was a magnificent seven in Archer's space. I like that sort of thing. It's a western, really. And I've always wanted to do westerns. Jenna. Jenna. We have waited for your coming for many years. Welcome. It pleases us that you are here. It was limitless. The storylines were limitless. It was, you know, in a sense, it was, you know, good versus evil. It was a sort of uh, dirty dozen in space. I think that was the idea originally, but it became more like Robin Hood in space. Come on, Blake. You don't want to die on your back. It was a bunch of supposedly criminals doing good. Um, were we terrorists or freedom fighters? I'm sorry, that's up to the audience to decide. In 1977, millions rooted for the Rebel Alliance against the Empire in Star Wars. A year later, the BBC presented a Them Against Us space opera set in a dystopian future. We were asked to back a bunch of renegade criminals in their fight against the Federation. And we did. That fanatic identification with the outlaws is crucial to the continuing success of Blake Seven, even though, at times, the show's cast can find it a little overwhelming. Oh, they say, wow, when you were going 25 spatials per second and you landed on a Raranor, why did you reverse thrust at that second? And you say, uh, what? <laughs> Mr. Thomas, um, in episode seven uh, of series two, when you said to Thermo, but I, I have to say, excuse me, I'm awfully sorry. I can't remember episode seven of series two, let alone what I said. It's 28 years ago. In 1975, in a BBC production meeting, Blake Seven's dark imagining of the struggle of good against evil was improvised by Terry Nation. Having already created the post-apocalyptic survivors and the country's favourite bogeymen, the Daleks, Nation had a habit of putting accessible and entertaining dark matter in front of a family audience. He wrote for Tony Hancock, for example. Uh, he wrote for the Avengers. Survivors. Did you ever see Survivors? It was a magnificent idea. Blake Seven was so clever because it was the first series where you had this hero uh, who was an anti-hero. Terry Nation's anti-hero would occupy a slot in the schedules previously filled by the cop show Softly Softly. But Blake Seven also inherited that show's budget. Being science fiction, that would challenge the producer David Maloney and series directors Michael E. Bryant, Veer Lorimer and Pennant Roberts. This was going to be a horrendous challenge because now you're being asked to do the equivalent of two Doctor Who episodes in what we used to term a long day and a short day in the studio. That's to say recording 50 minutes in, in, um, in a day and a half. Blake Seven shared its TV genes with programs like Doctor Who, Doomwatch and Survivors. But Hollywood blockbusters like Star Wars had raised the bar for special effects. That made life difficult for TV's special effects designers like Matt Irvin. Blake Seven was done at a time when Star Wars, or the first original and best three lots of Star Wars, was done. Um, I can actually remember producer Dave Maloney coming in saying, I've just seen this new film. Star Wars. Oh yes, I want, we want effects just like that. And me and Ian Schoons, my colleague at the time, uh, who we were both effects designers on it, we looked at each other and said, well, yeah, great, give us the money. Uh, we never quite got the same sort of money that Star Wars had got. If the special effects in Blake 7 couldn't compare to the bigger budget science fiction movies, then their creators would have to play to their strengths and concentrate on character and story. Chris Boucher, who had previously written for Doctor Who, was brought in as script editor and set to work on Terry Nation's original draft scripts. He said it was Robin Hood in space. <clears throat> I said, mm. um, and worked Beaver Away in the background to turn it into Che Guevara in space. They could have killed you. At the start of the story, Rog Blake, outlaw and freedom fighter, learns that the corrupt and ruthless Terran Federation has killed his family and erased his memory. To carry all this darkness lightly, the BBC went looking for a talented leading man with charisma to spare. 
In Shakespearean actor Gareth Thomas, they got what they needed. One had no concept at the time of going into something and saying this is going to be a cult programme or this is going to be a successful programme or anything like that. <laughs> Basically, it's going to pay the mortgage, it's going to do everything, you know, that's going to be, and it's going to put my face on television. Oh, it's no good. I'm going to go and have it out with Seth Anger. Gareth Thomas's CV at the time was a list of the best in TV drama, but playing bit parts and supporting characters. Blake Seven gave him his first shot at a starring role. The accused has been found guilty of... Falsely accused by the Federation of Child Molestation, <clears throat> Blake is exiled to the prison planet Cygnus Alpha after a show trial. In the holding bay before transportation, he meets two of his future crewmates. First, the cowardly petty thief, Villa, played by Michael Keating, who tries to lift Blake's distinctly 70s-looking digital watch. Easy, take it easy. I hate personal violence, especially when I'm the person. Who are you? I'm Villa Rest. Villa is, I think, not a, not a coward. I think he's just very careful. He's a survivor. He was a thief. Um... He doesn't want to go anywhere, doesn't take any risks. A bit like me, really, I suppose. If you're expecting a last-minute reprieve, you better forget it. Still, things start looking up for Blake when he discovers his other cellmate is somewhat easier on the eye. Space pirate Jenna, played by Sally Nivette. To begin with, the first two or three episodes, I thought the writing was quite exciting and quite good. I thought... She's a really feisty character. She's an intergalactic space pirate. She's the only one who knows how to drive the Liberator. She's been a freedom fighter, and she's, she's her own person. She's a strong individual. Watching all the goings-on aboard the prison transport with an analytical eye is Avon, super swindler and uber computer hacker, played by Paul Darrow. He takes an opportunity to prove himself invaluable to the irrepressible Blake. Do you know how those door panels work? No, not that time. It's simple enough. All authorised personnel have their palm prints filed in the computer. The blue sensor plate reads the print. If it conforms, the computer opens the door. He was um, completely focused on self. He joined the gang, as it were, um, because he had nowhere else to go. We hanged a dozen wrongdoers last week. What's so special about this lout? Paul Darrow had made a decent career out of playing baddies in TV shows like The Saint and Zed Cars. He even played the Sheriff of Nottingham in The Legend of Robin Hood. Back on board the prisoner transport, the necessary brawn required to seize the ship was provided by Strongman Gan, played by David Jackson. Look, we only need the hand. If you want to stay attached to it, do what you're told. While Blake and the other prisoners prepare to overpower their guards and commandeer the ship, the Federation crew are preoccupied with an apparently abandoned alien vessel. I don't believe it. Blake's uprising fails and he, Avon and Jenna are forced at gunpoint to board this intergalactic Marie Celeste, which, fortunately for them, is both empty and fully functional. I think what we felt was that the Liberator had to be stylish in a sort of supercruiser, but at the same time, it could not be a invulnerable supercruiser, otherwise that would actually take the drama out of the, um, the conflicts which our intrepid heroes would have to fight against. Try that one. Now, all Blake and his fellow conspirators aboard the newly named Liberator need is for experienced pilot Jenna to fly them to freedom except she can't work out how. But help is at hand in the form of prissy onboard computer Zen, played by Peter Tuddenham. Welcome, Jenna Stannis. Who is it? Zen, welcome, Rog Blake. Where are you? Show yourself. Blake, this is your reference point. I saw these um, computers as a sort of people, really, rather than mechanical instruments. And I try to vary them, give them different personalities. And then <clears throat> I gave a sort of like a, a very um, staid solicitor type, very laid back, knowing everything, perfect, you know, that sort of thing. The navigation units will accept your spoken commands. Please state speed and course. 
I want a course for the Earth Federation penal planet Cygnus Alpha. Blake's first instinct is to rescue the others. He springs Gannon Villa and goes straight to the top of the list of the Federation's most wanted. When we can handle this ship properly, we'll stop running. Then we'll fight. Gareth had a great deal of credibility and energy and commitment. And I think that that was um, very important for Blake, you know, the, 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 the outsider. Um, somebody who, who, who would be already been excluded from society and having to make a name for himself and gather around him um, a band of uh, adventurers to explore the, the galaxies. So the renegade fugitives band together. Cali. My name is Cali. And on an early excursion, rope in kindred spirit Cali, a telepathic rebel warrior played by Jan Chappelle. Is he one of your crew? Did she admire Blake's drive and purpose? or Avon's nifty weapon. I've had a gun on you the whole time. You were dead as soon as you broke cover. The main props that was used in virtually all the episodes on board the Liberator particularly was the Liberator gun, the guns that the, the, the cast inherited. They found them on board. But there was one flaw that I, Muggin seemed to inherit when he first started working on the programme. These packs, which have the, obviously have the batteries in it, I'm giving away a secret there, used to have jack plugs in them. And jack plugs will pull out and I found that they would pull out just slightly enough to short out the batteries so there will be Blake and Jenna and everybody they go da -da. oh it's not working because the batteries have been shorted and were dead with new batteries so my main contribution to Blake 7 is actually getting these are lockable plugs you plug them in they don't come out until you push a little button so now now the crew can go around killing anybody they want to you know, for as long as they want to do. Tiny budgets didn't just mean malfunctioning weapons. Lack of cash and BBC thrift combined to create the legendary Blake 7 sets. Ethan, what are you doing? <laughs> we had special effects, scientific effects, explosive effects, electronic effects. And so, we, you know, we were all losing wicket. We were fighting like mad to get the thing done. And of course there were wobbly sets occasionally. These pieces of sets got recycled all the time. But that bit of flattage, which has become the Liberator corridor, and is all now patterns and silver and black and whatever that fits in the Liberator, it could have been in the good life or whatever. It could have been the interior of Tom and Barbara's kitchen the week before. You've got it worked out, yeah? Educated guesses. Now, miniature models are one thing, but having actors walk out of a full-scale model on location is the stuff of blockbusters. So thankfully for the show's meagre resources, the wearer of one of the Liberator's transporter bracelets could be beamed down to and back from any nearby planets. Handy. And perhaps a neat um, homage to Star Trek? This would be worth a fortune to the Federation. We had, I think, something like 48 bracelets when we started the first series, and they were supposed to be in a rack. I think by the time we got to the end, we had two. Where did the bracelets go? They go on the actor's wrists. Boom. End of the scene. Okay, break, lunch. They wander back to the dressing room. It's either dropped off or they, oh, don't, don't want to go to the canteen. Right. Put it on the shelf. Forget it. Have you got another bracelet? Oh, all right, you've lost your bracelet. Fortunately for the hard-pressed design crew, Blake 7 was hugely popular with children, and an easy solution to the problem of missing bracelets was provided by Blue Peter's Leslie Judd. The outer covering, which is made, in fact, of plastic, a plastic bottle like that is ideal. They'd shown kids, hey, you can make your own Blake 7 teleport bracelet, piece of cardboard and some sticky back plastic. You've got to have sticky back plastic if it's Blue Peter. And they made these cardboard transporter bracelets. We did the same thing. I went to some of the guys and said, look, you know, quickly, cardboard tubes, same size, they never know. Well, in fact, my Blake 7 bracelet doesn't have all the powers of the real thing. I think it's a jolly good copy, though. What do you think, Pete? And they lasted for some time. We had some more made originally. So there are some genuine Blake cardboard teleport braces out there somewhere. Now there's no response from the ship. Perhaps these bracelets don't work anymore. We can't hold the original bracelets could beam the crew down to a variety of bleak-looking alien worlds which were strangely similar to quarries just off the M40. Doctor Who went to Tenerife once. I think the furthest we got was Bamborough. 
there was one occasion, I can't remember which pit it was, when the director said, Cut, cut, what's that noise? And sent the young runner. He said, go and find out what that noise is over there. And this young lad rushes across, comes back and finds, I'm terrified. They're around the corner. It's Doctor Who. <laughs> you know, I mean, mad. If Blake Seven was indeed Robin Hood in space, then the Sheriff of Nottingham character, in pursuit of the outlaws on the moral high ground, was the Federation Supreme Commander, Servalan. Blake has command of a superb space vehicle, but he is just a man, backed by a handful of criminals, and that is all. Servalan was originally intended to appear only in a single episode, but was such a potent character, she became a regular, seeking, locating and destroying, aided by her dirty work deputy, Commander Travis, originally played by Stephen Grief. Rescue is now your first priority. They wanted to put me in a safari suit, jack boots and a helmet, because she was the Supreme Commander. So, as you remember, I had very short hair at the time, so I said, well, with, if you do that with this haircut, you might as well cast a man. And I think it would be much more interesting to go in the opposite direction and make her incredibly feminine. I thought it was ludicrous in certain cases where she was in a ball gown and high heels running across sand, but that was part of the charm of the programme, I thought. You hesitated. My life was at risk and you hesitated. Well, some people say she was a psychopath. I'm sure she wasn't. She was a girl next door, really, depending on where you lived. But she was great fun to play. Under pressure to eliminate Blake, Servalan and Travis are also tasked with finding Aurak, the most powerful computer in the galaxy. Not particularly compact by today's standards, but portable in a beer crate kind of way. Blake, of course, beats Servalan and Travis to it. The interesting thing about Aurak is although he was a lump of perspex with coloured and some rings of lights in him flashing around, it was Peter Tunnam's voice that made Aurak. The idiosyncratic syntax of riddles interests me. They seem to depend for their effect on solecisms and grammatical discrepancies. Eh? Aurak, I, f I saw him as a little fussy little bank clerk who uh, wore a bowler hat and had a rolled up umbrella on his arm, even though it was very, very hot weather. That sort of thing. Very fussy. Is your it fully switched on? Yeah, of course I've got this switched on. By the end of series one, the show was regularly pulling in audiences of 10 million. And for the cast of relative unknowns, this meant newfound fame. I think the first time I realised his success was when I was trying to get a cheque cashed in a bank in Scotland, actually. And I went into, and I, I didn't have a, any identity on me or a bank card with me. and. Uh, I, I gave this check and the woman said, no, 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 I can't possibly, I haven't got any identity. And then two little faces popped up from behind the sort of thing and then they started whispering. And she says, oh, no, oh, that's, that's all right. Yes, we can check, we can cash that for you. Are you in Blake 7? When I was asking my autograph in Harrods, that, which was very nice, <laughs> and again in uh, the Palm Court room at the Plaza Hotel in New York, that was really good and impressed the bloke I was with. We went as a group for a meal in Covent Garden and one evening and Edward Heath turned up, he wasn't Prime Minister at the time, with his four bodyguards and they came over and uh, chatted to us and we said, well, we'd love to see your governor and he, meet your governor and he came over and said, well, he said, I've never seen Blake Seven but I shall certainly watch it next time. Nice to meet you. It was official. Blake Seven was a success. But halfway through series two, there were discontented voices coming from the set. And there's a massive difference between science fiction and fantasy. And I felt it was moving into fantasy. The second series had been. There were some weird things on planets with weird dressed up people and monsters and all this. And I thought, this has got nothing to do with the basic concept of them against us. Dissent within the ranks was spreading. Sally Nivette was about to mutiny as well. It became very clear to me quite early on that I was going to be a bit of a sort of sex symbol, something of a clothes horse. I mean, I remember we had a massive fight right at the beginning because they wanted me to have big hair and they wanted to dress me entirely in leather, sort of a bit like a Raquel Welsh sort of look. And Gareth and I went to the producer and said, this is crazy. 
this is not what she's about. Very soon now, the Federation ships will know exactly where we are, or at least where we've been. Gareth always had a slight problem with the show in that some pretentious actors with whom he associated um, at some stage asked him why he was doing this rubbish. And it got to him. Well, maybe I just don't like crowds. By the end of the second series, or by halfway through the second series, I began to think this is... It's not actually what I want. I've had better days. We must get him back. The BBC thought they knew how to keep him. The they offered me more money, and I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in more money. I want to direct a couple, that's all. Uh, and, you know, and they said no, and I said, fine, okay, excuse me, I'll go. Within three days of the end of filming on series two, Gareth was recruited by Trevor Nunn for the Royal Shakespeare Company. So how would Blake Seven be affected by its hero's departure? At the time, I was satisfied that a script had a dragon walk on water. You present me with a problem and I can solve it. Doesn't matter what it is. Um, in, in those times, you know. Um, so it wasn't really a problem. It was, he was easily written out. Closely following Blake through the departure lounge was Sally Nivette. But she had a different destination. I took an A-level and I got into university. Um, because the writing didn't change. And I think two years was about right for me. Series three, without Gareth Thomas and Sally Nivette, opens with the Liberator under fierce alien attack. When the crew abandon ship, do you know what? Blake and Jenna are gone, and officially listed as missing rather than dead. On the repaired Liberator, the crew have two empty cabins to fill. One by Josette Simons Dana, who seems to have a soft spot for Avon, and the other by Stephen Pace's Tarrant, who seems to have a soft spot for Servalan. Gan is now gone, killed off back in series two. Blake Seven started out as an adventure show and ended up as a soap. Um, and I think that's why it has a devoted following. Soaps tend to have devoted followings. Um, and also with people who sort of admit, yeah, some of the acting is pretty poor and some of the writing is, is completely off the wall. But you, know, you kept tuning in for uh, the, 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 the strangeness of the people, particularly in Jacqueline Pierce's remarkable sustained performance as the, as the, the dragon lady. You have Aurac. Avon, don't you see what that means? You tell me about it. She was um, the female version of him, if you like. But she was in the Federation, whereas he was a rebel. Except that he wasn't. He, uh, he was a rebel without a cause. You and I could build an empire greater and more powerful than the Federation ever was. She actually asks him at one point, uh, together we could rule the universe. And they go into a big clinch, and because um, she was quite attractive, wasn't she? And then he says, no, no, I'd be dead in a week. What a way to go. But um, she'd have him knocked off because he couldn't trust her. We would like to have seen it developed much more than it was, because I think that's more interesting than having actors standing there saying, stand up by 10. You know what I mean? Relationships should be about relationships always. Power. Series 3 ended with a bang. Forced to trade Servaland, the Liberator, for the return of his captured crew, Avon can't help smirking when the galaxy's finest ship is blown to smithereens of balsa wood and sticky back plastic. Miraculously, Servaland escapes. The saga would continue. Avon and the gang returned in 1981 for a fourth series, with a replacement ship, the Scorpio, a gun-slinging rebel by the name of Sulin, played by Glynis Barber, and we met Slave, the latest rather sycophantic onboard computer. Despite the show's continued popularity, the end of Blake Seven was in sight. It was felt that Servalan and Avon couldn't go on playing cat and mouse forever. You're going to tell us what we've got planned, Avon? We know what we've got planned. Running away is what we've got planned. A strategic... On December the 21st, 1981, nine million people tuned in to watch the last ever Blake Seven. The story was called Blake, so anticipation was high that the eponymous anti-hero would return. He'd always said he would come back for a death scene. 
if, if, um, if we could guarantee that the character was then gone from the series. And I got the script, and I read the script, and I said, fine. And I said, right, now what I want is a scar down here, because he's been away for two series. And he really was a rough, vicious character. What Blake had been doing in his two series away was recruiting a rebel force on the lawless planet of Gowda Prime, using as his cover the role of bounty hunter. She is who you say she is. I wouldn't have brought her in if I hadn't met her. I thought to myself, that's the way, actually, I would have liked to have played Blake. Because that's the... That's what he was, a vicious, honest freedom fighter. In the final moments of the episode, Avon and the gang catch up with Blake, and due to a calamitous misunderstanding, Avon is convinced that Blake has betrayed them. It's me, Blake. The Federation get involved, and a bloodbath worthy of Peckinpah follows. reminded me very much of the last scene or last act in in Hamlet everybody dying I thought it was a logical conclusion he would kill the only friend he ever really had that was the tragedy of it and um, I think that was part of the reason why the show was as successful as it was and uh, maintains a cult status, if you like. My reputation among the fans is the man who um, killed Father Christmas because the last episode went out, I think, on, on Christmas Eve or something like that. Um, announced as the last episode and then everybody was killed. Um, it didn't do much for the festive spirit, I have to say. So that was it. 52 episodes across four series and Blake 7 was over. But just because it wasn't on TV didn't mean it was dead. Its memorable characters and compelling storylines have created new generations of devoted fans and ensure that it has kept on shining brightly in the cult science fiction firmament. Blake 7 is certainly a cult show. Um, if you put on science fiction, you get a small but devoted audience. You knew they'd stick with the program. Um, almost, there are people who stick with the program admitting its faults, saying, yes, I know this is terrible, I know this, this bit doesn't work, but these things are interesting and this is why I'm going back to it. We had some great times, you know, it's certainly continued to follow me all my life, to my amazement. Oh, it was a, it was a piece of piss, I loved it. I said this before and I probably shouldn't say it again, but it was discovering I'd been a masturbatory fantasy for an entire generation of young men. I mean, that made a girl feel good. You get to beat up all the, all the stuntmen who are black belts in <laughs> karate or whatever, Knights Dan or something, but you win. Wonderful. I've never seen any of it. Enough! I've never actually watched myself on television. So, no, I've never seen Black Sun. I've no idea. Take a long look. It's the last you'll ever see it. No, I'm coming back.